Okay guys, welcome now to problem 10.1e. This is gonna be the last of our uh, Z tests on two population means. Here, this one, I've thrown it together it's very, very quick, very simple, not a whole lot of context or anything given. We're just gonna go straight into a test, okay? So, I know I have two populations again because I have here sample A and sample B. And it's telling me in the problem to formulate a test to see if there's a difference, if it's equal to five pounds. Formulate a test to determine that the difference between the two means is five pounds. So this gives us all the information we need to know what kind of test we're going to be developing. So here I have my null and alternative. I have my sample A and sample B. And once again, we see that little complication where we are now testing for a specific magnitude of a difference. So again, normally, if you don't see any specific number given, the hypothesized difference would be zero, right? And we would have something that looks like this. But now it tells us we're testing to see that the difference between the means is five pounds. So I know that this is a two-tailed test because it's not asking me to see if it's at least five pounds, more than five pounds, less than five, five pounds. Right, those are those clues, those key words that bring us towards a, a, a one tail test, either the lower tail or the upper tail. This is just saying, test, is it equal to five? Is it five or not? Our null hypothesis says, yes, it's equal to five, or at least I'm unable to say that it's not five. And the alternative says, no, I have evidence to show that it's not five pounds. Okay, so, so there's our test. We're doing this at the O3 level of significance. The rest of this, same old, same old, same routine. Z, we have our test statistic, the difference minus the hypothesized difference, our standard error, those standard, uh, those variances divided by those sample sizes. Oops, I don't know why I so often do that. And so here's my mean. I have 113 minus 105 minus the hypothesized difference is 5. And here I have our population standard deviations. So that's 5.1. And again, it's a standard deviation, so I have to remember to square it divided by my sample sizes. There's 5.4 squared divided by that sample size 30. So this gives me, let's see what I have, 113 minus 105 minus 5 divided by 5.1 squared over 35 plus 5.4 squared over 30. And so here I have my test statistic 2.29. We've done so many of these problems now. I imagine you guys are into this kind of routine, right? Because you see the similarities. Again, the only kind of complicating factor here is that non-zero hypothesized value. And it's really only a complicating factor because chances are the majority of the practice problems that you do, that hypothesized difference is zero. And so that puts you at risk of getting into this routine, right? This habit, and you stop thinking and just start doing. And when that happens, it's easy to overlook the little differences that can pop up. So here we've got our test statistic. Now we want our p-value. So I come down to our tables. I am looking for 2.29. And yes, I am using the negative side because the distribution is perfectly symmetric. 
What I want is the area in the upper tail from positive 2.29, right? But that's exactly equal to the area in the lower tail to the left of negative 2.29. Otherwise, if I look up positive 2.29, which I can do just fine, there's 2.2 and here's 9, and so I come down here, and I come over here, and again, that it, it gives me a useful value, but that's not the one that I want. What I need is 1 minus 0.989, because I want that upper tail value. Again, I, I know this because we're not quite finished yet, right? If I write this down and I say, well, my p-value, let, let's just assume that I make this mistake and I think, oh, that p-value, because I looked up positive 2.29, I think my p-value is 0.989. Oh, but then I realize, oh yeah, right. I'm not gonna get caught on this mistake again. This is a two-tail test, right? Well, if it's a two-tail test, I know that I have to multiply that by two. Well, do we see the problem here? I cannot ever, ever, can I ever have a p-value greater than one? If I multiply that by two, Absolutely, I'm going to have a p-value greater than 1. So we have to remember, when you're doing a two-tailed test, your test statistic might be positive, it might be negative. If it's positive, I don't want that lower tail probability, because when I multiply it by 2, it's going to be greater than 1. I want the upper tail value. If I get a negative test statistic, well, I don't want the upper value anymore because when I multiply that by 2, it's going to be greater than 1. So if I have a negative test statistic, I want the lower value. And that's what I multiply by 2. So our p-value here was 0.011. I multiply that by 2, and I have 0.022 as my p-value. Good, so that brings us to our conclusion. Alpha is 0 0.03 with a p-value of 0 0.02. Here I can comfortably reject. I say comfortably, but we are actually fairly close. 0 0.02 is pretty close to 0 0.03, but applying that rejection rule, our p-value is less than alpha. So here we are definitely going to reject. To interpret that conclusion, well, we weren't really given a great deal of context. We don't really know what this sample represents. So my ability to interpret is going to be pretty minimal. And here I'll simply be able to say that, well, we have evidence that supports the alternative hypotheses, which means that the difference between these two samples is not five. If I had more information about what these samples represented, I would incorporate that into my interpretation. But otherwise here, we have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. We do have evidence to show that the difference between these two averages is not five. So that's about it. Confirm with an interval. So in the previous video, again, we talked about how a test and an interval are two different things. But when two, two, two properties hold, they are consistent, right? We can compare an interval only to a two-tail test, which is what we have here. And, of course, only when it's a comparable level of confidence or level of significance. Our level of significance here is 0 0.03, which means that I need to develop a 97% confidence interval. So here's my formula. And you'll notice the formula is unaffected by the hypothesized difference, right? We have that hypothesized difference there of five. It doesn't matter because again, that's one of the differences between an interval and a test, right? An interval is just an estimate. There's no hypothesized values. 
There's no assumptions, no claims. It's just an interval. So the formula never changes, at least for two population means. So I have something like this. And here I can input our numbers. So my sample means are 113 and 105. That critical value, alpha divided by 2, this one I don't know off heart, off memory. That's going to be point, oops, point zero one five because alpha was 0 0.03. So when I go down to the tables, I'm looking for 0 0.015. And so here I find it right there. So that critical value is going to be 2.17. So I come back up here, I have 217. And now our standard deviations, 5.1 and 5.4. And our two sample sizes, 35 and 30. Now, once again, I am going to calculate that margin of error separately, just because I find it's easier to do it in a couple of steps rather than cranking all of these numbers through my calculator at once. A little more room for, for error there. So here I have my point estimate is eight. That margin of error, so that's just this piece here, is 2.17 times the square root of 5.1 squared over 35, 5.4 squared over 30. So my margin of error here is 2.84. So now I can calculate my upper and lower limits. This is going to be 10.84, and this is going to be 8 minus it's 5.16. So I have 97% confidence that the true difference in the population means is between 5.16 and 10.84. So this is that hypothesized difference between mu A and mu B. And again, did I say hypothesized difference? This is our confidence interval estimate for the true population difference between mu A and mu B. Now, how does this compare with our test? Our hypothesized value for the test was five. We rejected that. We said, no, I do have evidence to show that it is not five. How is this interval consistent with that conclusion? Well, I can see that it's consistent with that conclusion because at that level of confidence, it's between 5.16 and 10.84. At that level of confidence, five is not an option. Five is just over here. It might be close, but it's outside of that interval. So because it's outside of that interval, that is consistent with the alternative hypotheses. If I am 97% confident that it's between 5.16 and 10.84, well then at that level of confidence, I can say it's not equal to five. My evidence supports the alternative here, that it's not equal to five. Okay, so that's it, that's all there is to it. I say that as if it was nothing, but here we've gone through quite a few practice problems of two populations, one tail test, two tail tests, with a couple of different hypothesized values. So hopefully everybody is getting a good idea of how these, uh, how these work, I hope. And uh, we'll get on to the next section of uh, module 10 very shortly. Thanks for watching.